who would like to be able to go from, well, actually, I don't think anyone would like to go to DC these days, but if you could go from Bo Boston to DC in, say, 40 minutes, would, would you go there more often? Would it change the way you think about it? Yeah, probably. San Francisco to LA in, uh, in 35 minutes, right? Awesome, for like 20 bucks, 30 bucks, totally different experience, right? Now, what if, what if you were traveling at 750 miles an hour in a, in a steel tube? Uh, would you still be interested in, in doing it? Yes? Wow. That, we definitely have the right, the right crew here. I was, I was thinking, I was imagining people would be like, no way, that's crazy, you know, so, but I'm, obviously this is, these are the early adopters and, you know, the risk takers and probably 10% of you are going to, you know, die prematurely of something, you know, <laughs> some ill-fated choice. But, um, you know, I was thinking that most people wouldn't be interested in doing that in, you know, you have to kind of suspend the disbelief. Is that really possible? Can we actually do that? 750 miles an hour shooting down a tube in a pod with 20 other people just sounds nuts. You're sitting behind basically the equivalent of a jet engine. But then I think, wait, a jet? What's a jet? You're, you're flying in an aluminum tube at 500 miles an hour, 30,000 feet over the ocean, you know, with sitting on, on tons of fuel, right? We can suspend our disbelief and, and we can make things happen even if it seems impossible. So that's what the Hyperloop is. How many of you have heard of the Hyperloop? All right, good. Well, I, I really hadn't before I started working at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, over the last nine months, I've been working at the Integrated Innovation Institute. And while I was there, I became very familiar with it because I was uh, invited to be an advisor on the team. Now. This is what the Hyperloop is, and recently it's come to the fore because of this guy, uh, Elon Musk. You all know him because he, yes, he started Tesla and SpaceX and, and a number of other ventures that were very successful. And uh, he wrote in 2013 a white paper with this idea about the Hyperloop. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you, we all think of him as, as kind of this brilliant thinker ahead of everyone else. But the fact is, is that the Hyperloop has been around for a very long time. The concept of the Hyperloop has been around for a very, very long time. Actually, even before 1870. Now, what I like about this slide is that you can see that guy in the tunnel. That is the conductor of the first Hyperloop. And, and he's standing on the outside and it's going through the tunnel, and uh, it's only a block long. So I, I think it might have been called a hypo loop rather than a hyper loop. And I really can't understand the idea that was behind it. Like they couldn't walk a block in the, and this thing is moving really, really slow. Um, but the idea was was there, and the idea was that it was pressurized and that it was being moved by air pressure. So. Cut to, here we are in 2013, Elon Musk writes this white paper. And he says, this is a great idea, it's gonna be the fifth mode of transportation. We have boats, we have planes, we have cars, and what, what's the other, trains. Yeah, we have trains. But they're inefficient, each one has their efficiencies and inefficiencies. This is a fifth mode of transportation. But I'm not going to develop it. I want you all to develop it. I'm going to open this up. We'll support it with SpaceX knowledge and, and maybe a little bit of funding, but we're really not going to do anything. We're going to open it up to you. And so right away, two companies popped up, and they started working on this. They've invested tens of millions of dollars, right? And there are people working full time on this and like really, really big facilities, building stuff, the highest tech of highest tech, in addition to which, there was a competition that was started right after this came out. And it started to be organized by Texas A&M. And uh, initially, there were 700 applications from universities all around the world. 700 applications. No one's getting any money for this. They're just, these are like some of the smartest kids in the world that just said, this is really cool. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get involved with this. And 
some of those people were, uh, were at Carnegie Mellon. In fact, the school had 50 students that participated from the School of Design, from Engineering, from Business, from all different disciplines. And they worked through their vacations. They raised over $100,000, you know, and this is just one school. And they need to because, because, I'll explain later why they needed to raise so much money, but they're just doing this out of their own pockets, basically. And this is, this is uh, our team. And so I wanted to show you, at this event, they, it, it kind of went down from 700, and at the event, there were over 120 teams. This happened at the end of January 2016. 120 teams, about 1,200 students came, more were involved, and uh, it was all to propose the best design for a pod for the Hyperloop. And uh, it was like, I don't know, it was, it was like a, a science fair on crack. It was, it was, you know, just the most incredible event and everyone was so excited and, and doing such interesting things. And the way, I, I like this one, this, those red things in the back are our way of slowing down. They're, they're balloons that inflate and, and you're traveling through at 750 miles an hour in a tube and they're emergency brakes. So it pops open and you know, the drag will fill up in the tunnel and it'll, it'll uh, stop the, the pod from moving forward. I mean, look at the, look at the detail that these, these kids came up with. It was, it's phenomenal. So one of the things that, that a Hyperloop does, it's like who's played air hockey before? Right, you remember that that game is the, the there'd be lots of holes in the table and, and the puck would float on on there. Well, that's one of the the key components and characteristics of a hyperloop. So, I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the science. Now, I'm not an engineer. I'm I'm an industrial designer, but I became familiar enough to communicate with you. So, one of the things is that it has to float on air because any kind of wheel-based mechanism is gonna to create too much drag. So right away, once you get it off the ground, that's why planes can move so quickly. Um, there are two ways to do that. One is maglev, using magnets, and that's kind of the way that uh, you use in a high-speed train that they've been using, particularly in Japan, for many, many years. And the other is something called air bearings, which is more like the, the air hockey table. But instead of the table, uh, pushing the air out, it's actually skis that are, that are inverted onto the track. Now, the other, another characteristic is a, uh, is a tube. Now, the thing about this tube, I mean, this, this looks lovely. You know, you're, you're going through this tube at super fast speeds and you're, you're checking out the views and everything like that, but that's not actually what it looks like. You're actually gonna be traveling in a tube, that, in a steel tube that looks like that. But you'll see like, all the renderings make it look like, wow, you know, it looks so great. Uh, and, and the view from inside the tube looks something more like this. So, now, one of the things about traveling this tube is that the tube has to be pressurized. And, and so there's a pressure differential behind the pod and what's in front of the pod. So if you imagine that, that you're in this tube and you're pushing this pod through, if there's nowhere for that air to go that's in front, it's going to work like a syringe and the pressure is going to build up and it's not going to be able to move forward. So they have to remove the pressure to the equivalent of basically flying at 30,000 feet in the air in the front of the pod. And then behind, it doesn't matter what the pressure is, but you have to get the air from in front out the back. So how do you do that? You do it with this. You do it with a, uh, with a compressor. That, that's a lot like a, uh, a jet engine, it's a, it's a turbine. And, but as you can see here, what you, it, you have, that air has to go somewhere. So they filter it down through and sometimes the air, part of the air will be used for the air bearings and part of it will be used for propulsion, extra propulsion, and part of it may be used for steering. So I just wanted to show you some of the other designs that have come up. You know, they look pretty cool. They all look different. Now, the, the, the irony is that, that that's the front. You know, you think like that's gonna be out the back and it's gonna be shooting out, but it's actually exactly the opposite. It's not only for people. It, the first Hyperloop may be used for, for transporting uh, goods. 
So imagine that, that you can get stuff back and forth every, every 30 minutes between San Francisco and, and LA, between Prague and Vienna, between London and Paris. Yes, you can build a tunnel underwater, it's been done. Um, and this is someone's rendering of what it would look like inside the cabin. Now, each one is only about uh, 65 feet long. It can hold between 20 and 30 people. And here's some of the other characteristics. I wanted to share this with you for a couple of reasons. One, because it's just something that's very interesting and very cool. And the other is because we're talking about moonshots today. And this would be a moonshot for transportation. But think about all of the energy and the effort and the resources that went into to this, to transportation, this, this concept, how people willingly put in thousands and, and millions of, of hours into this and all the money. Now, what would happen if, if we did this for other things? How do we get people to do it for other things? And um, I, this, is, this is just, this is the, the captain of, of our team here. This is the moment that Elon Musk walked out on stage. They're like, he's, he's not gonna be here, he's not gonna show up, and they walk out and they're like, oh my God, it's Ringo Starr, or, you know, or maybe, maybe not Ringo, but. Um, in any case, the, the point is, is that people were inspired. And not only were they inspired, but they knew how to do it.